Hi all, Mess Barnkop from Kaiser Power Electronics here. Welcome to part two of the Aqua ADC 5155 X-ray image scanner teardown. Now this is the whole computer unit that I pulled out at the bottom of the whole yeah, tower that we took apart in part one. And as you can see, clearly it, it had some missing parts, but I just quickly powered it up and it would actually run all LEDs turning on and it would eventually go into some kind of halt mode. Um, so it also have a just a serial port here at the front that says uh, service. So I think we will just, uh, yeah, try to fire it up. So let's first take a closer look at the input output ports here at the front and then see if we can get something out of it. Now, judging from the parts we have here, we have a storage area here where the cables are just sticking out. That is clearly a uh, SCSI cable here. So some kind of very big hard drive, judging from the power connector here. Then we have a power supply next to it. Uh, nothing to see there, it's just a blank front. Then we have a CPU module. We have a reset, a halt switch, then FCWR, Mm, not too sure about that, but fail, busy, run, halted, x fall, run, status LEDs. Now, since it has two run indicators, I'm not sure if there's some kind of dual CPU unit. And then there's also a Ethernet, um, yeah, TXT collision connection and a serial port for service. Now then we get over to the more special insert cards here, the SCB, SAB, and adapter. Now the SCB and SAB are clearly to do with the whole image acquisition software or making it into a software. As we have the IV monitor, IV converter, and we also have the high tension control, pin, galvo, some kind of missing reset switch. And then there's a whole test block here. That's quite interesting. So that's some kind of header where we can actually see it's LD, FF, Reset, AD, MV, SOS. Seems to be a very low level uh, debugging interface here. And then we have the LD control, which probably connects up to the PMT assembly. Over here, we have busy analog digital conversion, compression mode, IVC test, filter one, two. Again, some status LEDs. Over here we have a Ethernet plug, Peltier control, 24 volt supply, a tag reader for the indication of the image plates, the LCD connector that was sitting at top of the unit, and then we have a IO bus for all the different parts that it would control. And we have indicator LEDs for the power supplies. Okay, so this just powers up once we plug in the power connector here. So let's just try that. And, oh, whoa. Okay, I expected to actually do some work for this. <laughs> so with just standard um, serial port settings, we actually got a connection to it. Uh, it's running into some kind of uh, wait until disk HD0 is ready. Yeah, of course it's not ready, it's missing. Uh, let's just try to reset that. So we're booting up again. Cold start. Whoa. It, it does something new every time I touch this. That's interesting. Searching syscon and then it just runs up in numbers. I'm wondering what this is going to end up at. Okay, so it went past 255. Okay, searching syscon 299, not found. Monitor. Okay, we actually get a prompt here. Interesting. Syscon. Unknown command syscon. Okay, let's just get back up to the start again. That, let's just try to clear that. Reset. Okay, it's trying to boot, that's for sure. Maybe we can hold it. Whoa! Wow, this turns out much nicer than I imagined it would. Let's try to scroll up and see what it actually says. Okay, so it started out with something like cold start, RAM, data bus, RAM alignment, 
RAM address 0 to 2000. And uh, I'm not going to read that hex code out, but that could be 2000 as well. Restoring breakpoints. Now, here it gets interesting. Monitor 4.28, copyright, Agfa Gavab, made in 30th of June 1998. So that's at least 22 years old. Today is October 12th, 2020. That's actually not all that off because today is it is October the 11th. So the date has drifted somewhere like a whole day since this was turned off. Not quite sure. I think this has been running uh, at least for a couple of years back. So you can see it's the, the Gemini Revision 4 board. It also had a sticker saying that at the front, but yeah, not able to find much uh, except some spare parts on eBay. And what we can see, it's a customer release, 32 megabytes of RAM, 33 megahertz. Oh, it's a 68,040 Motorola CPU. How nice. That is a legend of a CPU. I have worked on so many PLC systems uh, running on the 68020 or just 60 or 68K. And this is a pretty much a more advanced chip than the 00 and the 20. So let's see if floating points chip present, no. CPU chip present, 68040 running, slave CPU, no CPU. Okay, so it's a single CPU board we have. Interface module 0 BER IT25. Then it scans VME boards. I wonder what that is. I got no idea what control system this is running. But except it says auto boot bo bsp dot program. Let's see what it dumps out down here. It threw this exception when I um, flicked the halt switch. So that's kind of interesting. So my best guess here is that we will just have to try to mimic some of the commands that we see. VME, for example, what happens? Error VME two not reachable. Okay, so is one re no? That did not work out that great. Error number expected. Ah, a single question mark cannot be too many parameters. Come on. Hmm. What else did it have up there? Okay, that scroll up did not work. Me, sys, auto boot, bsp.program. Maybe we can call that program. Hmm. Oh. Resetting boards, scanning VME boards. Seems like I'm actually trying to boot it up again. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, so hard disk is still missing. Let's break that again. Oh, this is actually very fun. I got no idea what I'm doing. Um, VME one Gemini, maybe. Too many parameters. VME three, not reachable. Okay. So we have one, two, three, so probably not going to find anything. Okay, now it froze. Okay, we have a light and fail. Did not like that. Can we hold it again? Ah, a board switch. That's super nice to have. I did not think it would actually work like that. Okay, let's try to reset it again. Let's start all over. Just get to hold it now. Okay, like that, yes. See, I want to try me, sys, we tried the BO, that's what bought it, uh, booted up. And we have all these, um, seems to be some kind of um, RAM registers or all kinds of uh, memory addresses. We have data address, next. So, okay, so we actually get a that seems like assembler commands or some kind of language very close to assembler. Well, 
you must really chime in on the comments if you know how, how to uh, get on with this because I'm not sure I'm going to get everything sorted out in this video. Mm, exception, what do we have then? PC. Ah. No. USP, MSP, ISP, VBR, can't. Uh, seems like some kind of short names. SR. SR, TR, IM, SM, CC. SR, TR. Oops. Okay, there was another command. Interesting. Also seems like, um, okay, so, okay, TR is maybe trace through ISR. Huh. ISR, wrong keyboard layout, ah, uh, move, nope, IM, SM, CC, data, ADR, uh, I'm just throwing commands at it, maybe something works, at least it seems like we have found some commands now. Okay, no, uh, no return there. I'm also running out of uh, the history here, so I'm not quite sure <laughs> what I'm uh, dumping in now. Um, yeah, what can we try? Reset. Reset. Mm, boot. Ah, okay, we tried. BPO was boot. TR is trace. Hmm. Here we can see we, we dumped it at, okay, floppy drive. So it would have both a floppy and a SCSI hard drive. That's interesting. So it could actually also boot up on a floppy drive. Um, what else can we try? CPU, oh, cache, yes, no, cancel, deny, cache, no, enter level seven. Let's just try seven again. Ah, we just thrown back. Hmm. Okay, so I think I will try to reboot it again and then hold it on a uh, another part of it. Maybe we can get some more interesting results. Let's see. Oh, again, I get the floppy exception. That's not quite what we wanted. How early can, okay, busy delay two. A board switch, scanning on the VME boards. Uh, maybe we can try to call these uh, SCB. S uh, oh. Okay, so SC seems to give me this. Oh, that, that was just a mistyping. I wanted to type SAB. And I get SC and I, I find a new command. Command info, yes, please. Deep, whoa, debug level. Please, three, number of traces, nine. Give me everything you have. Dump registers, yes. Dump FPU, uh, floating point unit, we had none. Dump stack, yes. Okay, we actually see the settings uh, coming up here. Terminal port. Uh, Okay, that's one already. Host port zero, auto boot. Whoa, I found the settings menu. Woo! Auto boot, uh, yes, 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 let's keep that. Use RT scope. Mm. Okay, boot command string. Interesting. Yeah, let's just go with that. SCSI, yeah. I got no drive. Let's just repeat those settings. Let's mm. just start over. Okay, so I can just repeat them. Okay, I get up in some loop here. Maybe I have to hold my way out of it. Let's just get all the way through again, like that. Halt. 
a board switch. No. I got no idea. Let's try to reset it now that we asked for a different debug level. Yeah, unfortunately, no, no more new information. Again, we get the cannot get the hard drive. So let's just abort it. Okay, so so far we have CPU, TR, BO, SC. So it's not the restricted to two character commands as we have the CPU. And yeah, I'm not quite sure what else we have. Error not found. Okay, so it actually takes arguments into the CPU uh, command. CPU zero, not found zero. So I'll say that was quite an interesting uh, experience here with just booting up an old computer and getting a command interface right away on a service serial port. You do not find that on many computers today. So uh, I hope some of you uh, have something to help me with get on with this operating system. But else, uh, let's get it taken apart and take a look at the boards and see what's inside. Now we at least do know how much RAM and what CPU we have in it. Before taking a look at the different cards, I would just point out that the Ethernet port over here actually sits with its own flat band cable that goes to the back of the backplane. And from here on it actually goes to the CPU card that has the network card built in. The backplane has five rows of 96 pin headers, which is of course, female at the bottom of the backplane here, and then we have male plugs at the cards. Taking a look at the back side, we can see that there has been done quite a lot of work over here uh, with some flat cables, both for the SCSI interface, the floppy drive, uh, but also the network interface that we have sitting over here. Now these both go out, go out from the same slot here to the CPU card, that's worth noticing. And we actually have the SCSI driver as connecting to the bottom one here, so we have to remember that SCSI driver goes at the bottom, network card and floppy at the top here. Other than that we only have some power distribution over here from the power supply. And that just sits with a huge amount of cable shoes sitting here. Has a few markers down here with the 5 volt ground, sys fail, AC fail, sys res, bus clear, and it's just stamped VME bus. Let us first take a look at the IO bus adapter and Ethernet connection card here. As we can see, the flat cable connector goes directly to the Ethernet port over here. No connections to the backplane whatsoever. It also had a external power supply input, which probably has to do with the 24 volt plug sitting here at the front. Other than that, it only has a small bit of logic sitting over here. Actually, it says version 0, 1, 2, Free. And then you can put in some resistors, that's quite interesting. Uh, it is marked with Akfa Gewert, uh, so all the PCBs are made by Akfa itself. Has some, yeah, I, I assume we can only say this is probably inductors from the marking L15. We have some voltage regulators and a lot of electrolytic capacitors and a large 3.2 amp fuse. Now, it's worth noticing these special noise suppression inputs uh, here. It seems to be some kind of ferrite rod going through a grounded loop and then perhaps a wire going through the middle. And here we can also see a small ferrite bead just sitting around two data lines. 
Next up is the SAB card, which was the IV monitor and IV converter. So this was what we thought to be a analog to digital conversion unit. And as we can see here, it has a nice gold plated analog devices. AD7886 JD analog to digital conversion chip. For the monitor, we have a single AD T739 and AD734 and that probably corroborates together and for the converter itself we have the gold plated chip connects over here to the upper connector and that actually brings me to the point about the VME bus that we saw on the back plane that this is, as I mentioned earlier, very similar to some ABB products that I have worked on. And after I looked up VME bus, it only makes sense that, of course, it's only also the same as the old semantic uh, systems that I have worked on from Siemens, that the VME bus standard was developed by the Motorola team that made the Motorola CPU, and they made their whole own standard setup that you could use for your designs and that is why a lot of the Motorola 68 designs are so similar. So here we have the SCB card, this is high tension control, some tests, pin and galvo and LD control so, and it quickly jumps to our Attention that this is controlled by Xilinx XC4006 FPGA. We have a DC-DC converter as we also had on the IV converter board. And other than that, it's just a wide range of different inputs and outputs, all routed back to either high or low side of the back plane. Now, what really made me jump to the conclusion that this was so much like a ABB product was the placement of these boards that the APB Masterpiece 200 controllers would have its network card sitting here and its RAM card sitting here exactly like we have on this model. And I was just like, hey, wait a minute, I've seen this before, but this says ACFA all over it. So looking back at when we saw the backplane, we saw that the row two of the cards here that had the floppy drive and also the network card so we would expect that the Sonic chip here and this other NSC chip, they are the network controller and also the floppy drive controller. We can now safely remove the network card. We just have a plastic spacer there. And we can remove the RAM extension card here. And now we see the Motorola Base 68K platform in all its glory. And here you can actually see the slot for the second CPU or was it perhaps the FPU? I'm not quite sure if the floating point unit would come as an extension card or if it is one of these because you could also insert a second CPU. But I can see that the main CPU, which is, okay, that's glued on the heatsink, but the main CPU is a surface mount version of the 68040. We have a timekeeping RAM sitting over here. That's simply a RAM chip with a battery on top. On that we have a wide range of crystals, 64 megahertz, 40 megahertz, 66 megahertz. 3.68 megahertz. Actually, uh, quite interesting that we do not have any 33 megahertz um, sitting here as the CPU runs 33 megahertz. Other than the one sitting here at the main board, we also have a 20 megahertz and 24 megahertz. But as we have a 66 megahertz, we can only assume that half of this is used for the clock cycle. For the whole backplane interaction and the interfaces, we have three Xilinx FPGAs, 
4010, 40, and 4010. We also have a VIC 64, and as we had a VIC command to the hardware interface, that could be that the hardware interface specification actually is due to this chip they have used here. We also have a SIM BIOS IC thing over here. The power supply is quite interestingly not a custom job, but seems to be a Aztec LPQ252, which just takes a AC or DC input, and there is no information about the secondary side. We can see it's manufactured in 2000, week 28. But if we take a look over here, we can see that it has some markings. Voltage 1, common, voltage 4, return, voltage 3, common, common, voltage 2, and then voltage 1 underneath here. And over here at the main side we have ground, phase, neutral. And there's not so much to say about this. It's a pretty standard modular power supply, except that it does seem to since it's not marked with some special voltages, that these cards we can see inside can just be soldered in according to the voltages you need, and then you can change the output connectors. Only fun thing to notice here is this small capacitor sitting across the positive and negative rail of the, what I can only assume is the 5 volt rail, uh, for noise suppressing, that it's just soldered up here between the two terminals and not sitting somewhere down on the board. So it's a couple of days later and I have found out a few new commands by just uh, juggling around with the key combinations. So let's take a look at that. And here we have the boot up sequence. Looks as all the other times. Let's just hold it right there. And what I did was I found out that most of these commands do actually include an E. So I just tried out two and three letter commands that at least had E as the last letter or the second letter. So uh, I, what I found was TE got me into this test mode. And then I just yeah, continued my search for random commands and I actually got to HE. And to my big surprise, this actually gave me the help menu that I had been looking for on the main um, command line. So you can see here it has some, yeah, wait 10 seconds, kind of a weird uh, test command. But uh, it can do some IO check, it can test the dynamic RAM, and you can see this help, but you can also quit this again. Now, once I knew that, yeah, HE is for help, we can also try it at the main command, and here we have it. Now we have everything. And it is quite clear that this uses some kind of Asterix Linux shell. Uh, it can also run a small DOS, uh, and it has some remote control called a VME or VTX, uh, VME remote control. Uh, we can also take a look at the hardware. See, we get some interrupt channels for the different channels on the CPU and vectors and such, and all the DMA and disk statuses. And we can just get back to the help menu here. We can try the enter DOS mode here. And here we can actually try help again. Is it, uh, HE. Here we can see we have change directory, directory, dump, type, copy, delete, do, fat, info, show, part, he, load, save, quit. So it's a lot to do with partitioning uh, work and also file handling that they have a small DOS installation on this EEPROM. So we can just quit that again. So I hope this gave a much better view into the small monitor 4.28 system here that runs on EEPROM on the main processor. Um, I also did find out if that's actually quite interesting. If we go into the uh, PRJ, which is select a project, and we can see here that it's running the ADC project. 
And that's quite interesting because that tells us that this computer is actually used in both the Antrax, the Andonis, ACS100, Scanner, Chroma and Portex applications. And now by yeah, just googling these, the, these turns out to be old Agfa products. And especially the Portex is actually a complete operating system made by Agfa used to run on their systems to yeah, ensure that you have high security and also data exchange between the different products is ready and available. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot change the project to another uh, one. Let's see if we want to run Portex. Or was it? Ah, okay, we have to take the project number instead. It says unknown EEPROM type. So, of course, it needs another set of EEPROMs in order to boot up in that specific application. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you find this vintage computer as interesting as I do. It was quite an adventure to just type in random commands and see what I get out. And here we have it. We have a complete overview of everything that this computer can do. And it actually seems to be, seems to be a quite a low level access into the CPU that we can actually write directly to the RAM and shift out blocks and such. So quite, uh, quite interesting, even uh, modify registers in the CPU. So um, please subscribe to the channel, sign up for a membership if you like, or check out some of the awesome merchandise. So until next time, see ya.